Behold the electronic evolution of Gridfinity. My 3D printed modular storage system has been amped up with nearly 9,000 LEDs and exactly 69 magnetic sensors. Nice. It doesn't just drench every bin in glorious RG and B. It can track every item in the workshop so I can search my stuff like I'm searching the web. And you know what? This isn't even the project. This is a prototype of half the project. The easy half. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, I am proud to welcome you to the actual studio of Voidstar Lab. It took the entire year to set this up, and our play button took a little battle damage, but we can fix it in post. <laughs> We're about to kick off a truly ambitious project, something bigger and more bonkers than anything I've built before. I am going to need everything I learned in a decade of freelance prototyping, and along the way, I'll show you how to boost the odds of finishing your projects. The workshop of tomorrow begins today, after the shortest sponsor shout out on my whole channel. This episode is sponsored by Oracle Database, whose requirements were A, the project uses Oracle Database, and B, I finished the video by mid-October. That last part did not happen, so let's hope they grade on a curve. If this is your first time seeing Gridfinity, welcome to the club. It'll consume your life. Gridfinity is a system of organizer blocks and divider bins that slots into a 42 millimeter grid. It's free as in freedom for anyone to 3D print. And before you ask, I ripped this off Alex Chapel, not the other way around. You can configure Gridfinity as a desktop caddy, a drawer organizer, or as I promised in the launch video, a wall-mounted small ports, ports organizer. <laughs> like my previous storage project, the parts rainbow. It's right, it's right there. But I never ended up building that. Was it just another empty promise to scam you into subscribing, which you should totally do right now, then hit the bell? Well, it's complicated. Not the bell, it's just this little icon near the subscribe button. It's right under the video. There it is. Mm -mm -mm. The truth is, the wall-mounted rainbow Gridfinity actually came before Gridfinity itself. That glass front window bin is the only one that I've ever designed that shows its contents from the front, and that was the prototype. The 3-inch microscope slides I used for windows are a major reason why the grid is 42 millimeters. The rainbows would come from RGB LEDs embedded right in the frame. If you open up the core Gridfinity model right now, you'll still see unused geometry to embed LED tape. I never built the wall mount Gridfinity because it turned out to be a terrible idea. For one, the only thing keeping the window on the bin and thus the parts off the floor was two millimeter wide double stick tape. It turns out that sticks to neither PLA nor glass particularly well. I could have beefed it up, but a 40 drawer organizer already packs way more crap per cubit cubit. On top of that, the open hardware ecosystem just went mad with power and made thousands and thousands of custom storage blocks for all kinds of specific items. I just couldn't figure out how to simultaneously pack more stuff in, handle more accessories, and see what I have without windows. The answer lay in sci-fi's bleakest future, Wally. The can crushing cutie keeps his spare parts in this motorized elevator rack. It's hard to describe, just tab back over and look at it. This is a real mechanism called a vertical carousel. It's a stack of shelves mounted on roller chains that run floor to ceiling. This doubles capacity by stacking shelves too deep. And then it doubles it again by storing stuff too high or too low to reach by hand. Since any link can carry a shelf, I can pack the bins as close together as I want and still give the fancy stuff extra Headroom. All of those chains, cogs, and shelves need to be made of tough stuff, uh, but if I were to machine them from metal or print them from high-strength filament, it would just take forever. But the real challenge is just going to be finding what I'm looking for, right? At least half my parts and tools are going to be hidden behind a fairly slow conveyor belt, and, you know, the prime directive of Gridfinity is to see what you have at a glance. Ideally, I would need some sort of database and front end to search them for me. I don't really know how to make databases or front ends. So I banish the Wally Wallmount Gridfinity to my shitty list of shitty video ideas. You know, like, maybe one day I'd catch a break on the fabrication or the search system. Well, a few months ago, I caught both. The first was Oracle database itself. Like, not only was a workshop inventory a perfect fit for a sponsored build, but the product itself changed the math. I basically logged into the Oracle cloud, clicked give me an autonomous database, and two minutes later I could store and search up to 20 gigabytes of arbitrary data with absolutely zero SQL. If you've ever used SQL, you know how important it is to avoid using SQL. If I can track which parts are in which bins and which bins are in which slots, Oracle basically did the hard part of cataloging and searching it for me. I now had a doable project, and that brings us here. 
As for the carousels, I'm not supposed to talk about this yet, so don't go running your mouth on social media, all right? This is between you and I. This is a Pantheon HS3, the most gratuitous god-tier printer I've ever seen firsthand. In 24 hours, this thing can print an entire kilo of Pantheon Special Carbon Fiber PETG, and they claim those models are as strong as plywood. Well, I do eventually have to give this thing back, I can't see how I will actually pull that off. This printer weighs over 100 pounds, and it almost flattened myself and a task rabbit as we struggled to lug it down seven stairs. Not seven flights of stairs, seven stairs. That's a problem for future Zach. Present Zach has to go looking for new problems, because today we're building prototypes types. Every unknown unknown, from the precision of a sensor to the insulation on a wire, is a potential project-killing, game-ending brick wall. The more ambitious the project, the more of those dice you're rolling, and the more you stand to lose if a single one of them hits a one. Back in the day, clients would commission me to prototype their smart socks before they burned a million bucks, learning things like, nobody needs smart socks. Then they would bring it to market and burn a million bucks anyways. In their defense, they paid me first. Today, I'm the client, and the commission is a functional prototype type of a Gridfinity compatible workshop search system. This means I have to set some boundaries up front because a cognitive bias called the IKEA effect is going to make me fall in love with whatever I put time into building even if it sucks. Even if I really was a mythical super genius 10x engineer that still means 99.0% of my ideas suck. Good planning lets reality be the judge. Constraint number one, each slot must take no more than three minutes to assemble. I'm going to need about 1,500 slots of storage, and while our awesome Patreon patrons have funded more than that, I can only take like three days off every couple months. Once I gut the old storage, I can't stop till those parts have new homes, so if I can't construct a massive part of this in six days, I probably never will. Constraint number two is going to be a little controversial. I'm not designing this for others to build. This is a really, really big project, and if I also had to write assembly guides, only use accessible parts, and limit myself to hobbyist-grade tools, I don't think it would actually be possible for me to finish this project. So that means I have a question for you. Is it okay for me to splash out, or do you think I should limit future projects to only stuff you can make as well? I really want to hear what you have to say. Constraint number three is it must have Oracle Database on the back end. The hippies lost and I can't feed my puppies your so-called integrity. So the very core of the light up Gridfinity concept, which I can no longer avoid calling Litfinity, is finding and lighting up bins. The light part is fairly easy. I have Ergobled tape with about a 7mm pixel to pixel pitch. A Gridfinity slot is 42mm, 42 is divisible by 7, there you go. So I took the base plate and I curved out a trench to lay in the Ergobleds. The adhesive backing didn't really stick well to PLA, so I changed the trench to a track it can slide into. Detecting the bins was harder. I already know we're going to be using RFID to track which bin is which, and I would love to put an RFID reader in every slot. But our patrons, while generous, are not 8,000 bucks of RFID readers generous. But then it hit me. Gridfinity sockets have magnets, and magnets are magnetic. This is a reed switch. It's a glass capsule with two wafer-thin metal strips just a hair apart. When a magnet gets close enough, the reeds attract each other and complete the circuit. You may have seen the boxy plastic version before. This is the same glass capsule just armored up with epoxy. These things are bigger and much more expensive, and come on, how much damage could a switch in a base plate take, he said foreshadowingly. So I carved reed switch sized trenches in the base plate and I glued one in. The goal here was just to get a switch and a bin in realistic position positions just to make sure everything works. You may be wondering, if that's the plan, why'd you make a 4x4 grid instead of a single slot? That is because I'm very rusty at prototyping and I made a lot of amateur moves today. This really would have paid off because it didn't work. The reed switches were super finicky and barely detected the bin at all. I assumed the little disc magnets were just too weak to reliably close the circuit, so I looked for something different. I rummaged around some more in my bin o random magnetic sensors, I really need an inventory system, and I found some AH-49E hull sensors, which are ancient leftovers from the somatic data glove, my channel's very third project. A reed switch can only tell you whether magnet or not magnet, but a hull sensor can measure how strong the field is. That means we don't need to get the position perfect. As long as the bin's magnet is the strongest magnet in range, this thing should notice it. I soldered it up, I glued it on, and it worked! Yay. 
So I strapped on my VR headset, jacked into the metaverse, and had ChatGPT order some big piles of hall sensors and LED strips. This sh is the future. I would bet my bottom dog coin. Then I snuck a little something extra into my cart. Many Gridfinity storage blocks have multiple compartments, so if I want to do this job right, I'm going to need to track parts on a per compartment basis. That calls for some way to light up a specific part of the bin, and while it would be on brand to cover my entire workshop with ErgaBleds, the current draw really starts adding up. But there's just one base station, so why not bedazzle that bastard? This is an LED matrix, a 64 by 64 grid of teeny weeny LEDs that are spaced just two millimeters apart. That means if I put two of these together, it almost perfectly fits a humongous six by three slot bin, and it lets me highlight compartments down to a tiny two millimeter. While I waited for my order, I modified another base plate to snap onto the matrices and wondered where to put the hull sensors. It's not strictly necessary for the base station to know how big the bin is, but I still want it to gather as much data as possible. Anything it doesn't collect, I'm going to have to type in myself, and I hate doing anything myself. I couldn't put the sensors under the magnets because then they would block the RGB matrix. They had to go around the edge. I was feeling good about this. That made me overconfident and immediately derailed the project. First mistake, I modeled a full-size base plate instead of isolating one slot with one sensor. Making an end run compared to doing the simplest possible proof of concept took like five times longer to design and at least ten times longer to print. Next mistake, I wasted hours and hours sculpting nice curvy tracks to route the wires. It feels so good to get sucked into a project, but this isn't a project, it's a prototype. What happens when making it takes 10 times longer than testing it, and the test fails? I snapped in the LED matrices, I wired up the sensors, glued everything in, teachable moment. Here are two more mistakes. I didn't have to install both matrices. That just takes time and risks destroying parts for no gain. I also only needed two halt sensors, right? One for column, one for row. I didn't have to install all nine. The matrix actually worked really well, and lighting up the individual compartments looked really cool but the sensors weren't sensing the magnets, even though they were practically touching. Excuse my profanity, but what the heck? <sighs> Turns out my high school physics had atrophied worse than my prototyping. Magnetic fields don't shoot straight out of the poles. They curve from north to south, and the closer together the poles are, the wider the field. These are really small magnets. You can tell because it says small magnets on the box. So when I put the reed switch dead center, I was putting it in the weakest part of the magnetic field. As for the hull sensor, that wasn't working because I put it perpendicular to the magnet. It only detects field lines that pass through it, not across it. All I had to do was shift the reed switch over a little and bend the hull sensor 90 degrees, and they both worked perfectly. It was easy to roll the base plate back to using reed switches, but the base station was not so straightforward. All that time I spent modeling and running sensor wires and all nine of the sensors themselves had to go straight in the trash. No matter how experienced you think you are, you will f up. The key is to cut your losses before and after the f up. The more you stand to lose, the stronger the temptation is going to be to f further up by trying to, and I am using the biggest finger quotes I can, make it work. I did the right thing by chucking the base plate, but I tried to make my model work by reusing those wire channels I put so much time into. The problem is I designed these for an unbent sensor, so the leads were now too short to actually reach them. I was still designing and printing these things full size, so this 10 car misplay pileup wasted over two entire work days. When you fail, don't try to salvage it. You do not deserve to make progress just because you put in the work. Make it fast, make it sloppy, and assume it's going right in the trash. I wanted my LED matrix mini base plate thing to act as a scale. If we could weigh the bins, the system could automatically tally inventory. So I went to Micro Center and found this build your own scale kit. This uses a beam style load cell to weigh a platform, which is exactly the configuration I assumed we would use. Off the shelf is always better than custom because someone else did the design and fabrication for you. The included load cell had a five kilogram limit, but it still seems sensitive enough to detect like individual nuts and bolts. So I printed a plate to attach the matrix straight to the load cell. All we needed now is a computer to run the software and an NFC reader to identify the bins. I had an Orange Pi 800 left over from my spam folder review roundup. 
It's got a keyboard, it runs Linux right out of the box, but it doesn't have an actual Pi's easy to use libraries. Arduino does have easy to use libraries, so I would just have to use a microcontroller to handle the hardware. I hope you can see why I'm so bad at low level development. Like when you're prototyping, you want to actively avoid anything clever. The Orange Pi 800 is shaped exactly like the Raspberry Pi 400, suspiciously so, and it fit into this frame to turn it into a cyber deck. I printed and fit the original model, then I modified it. You don't download someone else's file and immediately start modifying it. You try it out first before you f it up. Every NFC tag has a unique serial number burned in at the factory, so I never need to worry about two bins ending up with the same ID. The reader can pick it up from a distance even if the tag is moving or angled. It turns out even this crappy $5 board could read a crappy 20 cent sticker in just a few milliseconds. This got me an unexpected bonus. I can scan a sticker on the bottom of a bin as I drop it into place. I'd rather put the stickers on the sides so I don't block those luscious erga blades, but some bins are just too short. Not every prototyping surprise is bad. It might work better than you expect. It's just another reason not to overdesign. I started wiring up the base station and I face palmed so hard it rattled the heavens. The ESP32 board didn't have enough pins to drive all this crap. I had to scrounge up a teensy to handle the hull sensors. It's been too long, old friend. But then I face palmed again so hard it rocked the firmament. The ESP32 was blocking the HDMI port. I need that. I could modify and reprint the frame. I could try a super thin HDMI cable. Maybe I could get a different microcontroller. Wait, 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 wait. Why am I fighting so hard to keep using these particular parts? Could it be because I spent hours on them? The fucking Ikea effect almost got me again. As face approached Palm, an angel knocked on my door and politely asked, could you kindly keep it down? Some of us have to go to work tomorrow. I already had the solution close at hand. When one goes to Micro Center, they must spend an extra $200. Grass grows, wind blows, when you get a build your own scale kit at Micro Center, you grab a Raspberry Pi 400, you know, just in case. Well, this was the case. I just plugged everything right into those super easy to use GPIO pins and yote that microcontroller. That's the past tense of yeet. We've arrived at the fun part, not because it's enjoyable, but because it's short for functional prototyping. This is where we pull it all together and get our cheeks whipped on a higher level. I decided to move the reed switches to the top side. This let me weave bare wires through the plate instead of having to strip little segments of insulation where columns cross rows. Remember, every single second spent assembling a single slot is gonna multiply into hours when I build out the full system. I decided to make my prototype base plate a 4x15 grid. That is big enough to actually use, but still small enough that I can run the segments on all my printers at once. Plus, I can read all 15 columns with the I.O. expander from my Mirage mechanical keyboard. I haven't forgotten about it. It got a little damaged in the flood, and I just haven't had time to deal with it. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. A lot of shoutouts to past projects this episode. I put a lot of work into getting this prototype's fit and finish right, but this time I did it intentionally. I had already tested each part and most of the parts in conjunction, so any technical backtracking at this point is probably going to be minor. Still, you'll notice that I divided that top into a bunch of different segments. That's so there's less to replace when something goes wrong. This is also where we test the user experience, which only generates good feedback when I experience using it. My Amazon orders were really starting to stack up. They were starting to recognize me in the metaverse. ChatGPT was like, this fucking guy. <laughs> Assembly was super easy because I, you know, like I prototyped the shit out of it to make it that way. First, I glued the base plate segments together. The parchment paper and accelerator spray let me just rain glue on it and cure it instantly. There's no reason to be precious. It's a prototype. Remember, I'm only making this for me and I'm not afraid of commitment. Look at that shit. I didn't make this clear, but the parchment keeps the super glue from sticking the project to the workbench. <laughs> Going big also let me time the assembly, which turned out to be way faster than I planned. This whole idea of just like grabbing some non-insulated bus wire and weaving it through tracks was super fast. Everything was held in position for soldering. The LED strips just fed into their little channels. I even found this whole 3D printed jig to perfectly pre-bend 20 leads at once. It took less than an hour to get ready for the reed switches but the reed switches were not ready for me. I put 10 in the jig, I pressed down, and all 10 instantly shattered. 
I had bought all glass reed switches on Amazon.com for 29 cents each, and I got exactly what I paid for. These are, do the kids still say no cap? The most fragile electronic components I have ever used. I needed to use pliers to bend each lead because the strain would smash them. A few got smashed by the heat of soldering. A few more got smashed when I clipped those wires. A few got smashed when I put down bins. A few more smashed for no apparent reason whatsoever. On top of this, around 1 in 20 arrived conveniently pre-smashed. Are you laughing at my misfortune? <laughs> you love when I have misfortune. I I only had nine spares. A full 21 had smashed. I should have bought the name brand stuff with the black epoxy. Saving a few hours is far more important than saving a few bucks. All that remained was wiring the wires and enclosing the enclosure. I was running off parts with as many printers as possible, but I just didn't have enough reels of the same filament. When I got to those column sensor wire covers, that's why I made it a rainbow. Now it looks like I support gay people. I mean, like I do, but it's not relevant to this particular project. I endorsed human rights for no reason. Writing the code was mercifully boring. I already had known working test scripts for every component, so I just Voltron them together and bolted on some business logic. Do you remember how in the home automation episode, I said my new home assistant would play a role in this project? You don't? Because YouTube didn't fucking show anyone that video? Well, I'm using the MQTT broker I set up for the dehumidifier. This is a very simple protocol that lets any device publish a message over Wi-Fi, and any other device can subscribe to receive them. This is so easy. As a side effect, I can now make a bin turn my lights off. This serves no practical purpose, but I'm no practical person. So I made the LED matrix light up the frame itself, and then I made the frame light up in rainbows. I paid for red, green, and blue. I'm gonna fucking use all three. When a bin goes down, the teensy beneath the matrices detects it via the hull sensor and notifies the Pi. The RFID reader already picked up the bin's ID as the bin landed, so this is the signal to run it through the Oracle database. If we've never seen the ID before, it prompts me to enter how many compartments it has and what's in each one. That whole light each bin up a different color thing actually turned out to work really well. This is really smooth to use. Note how this prototype all runs on the command line. Graphical user interfaces are incredibly time consuming, especially when you don't know JavaScript and you also hate it. I'll have to pick that fight eventually, but for now, an all text interface shouldn't be that bad. We don't want to end up using a touch screen as a crutch. If there's no bin in play, the command line does the real magic. It serves as a search bar. Oracle Database's built-in text search scans my whole inventory, looks for the item, and finds the bin that contains it. The base station publishes an MQTT message saying if you got a bin and the bin's got Got this ID, light that shit up. The base plate replies with whether the bin was registered there and whether it actually is there. That means the UI can tell me whether to go straight for that base plate, straight to searching the workshop, or straight to the loony bin because I'm hallucinating ball bearings again. If I actually do end up making the vertical carousels, the user experience is basically identical. The only difference is the carousel will scroll to the right shelf before it lights up the bin. But this system absolutely stands alone, at least after I work out the one full-on failure. The final feature, the one I was the most stoked about, that built-in scale to automatically track my inventory. The hardware worked fine on the test bench, but it turns out it just can't play nice with the rest of the system. I have to run wires between the plate and the Pi to read the sensors and drive the ergobleds, and even my softest, most supple silicone wire still carries a tiny fraction of the weight. All the weight has to go through the load cell or the readings are unusable. After I wrap this episode, I might try deleting the wires altogether and inductive charging the platform. And that is the first phase done on my ultimate smart organizer system, which I guess I'm calling Litfinity. We got a base plate to store our parts, a base station to search for them, and a database to track them. This project is based. While I stock it up and do long-term tests, the next step is prototyping the mechanical parts. I have to see if I am actually capable of designing this contraption, and then torture test the filament to see if it can actually bear the weight. This is the craziest project I've ever started, and it's only made possible by Voidstar Lab's phenomenal patrons. Every episode, I shout out three random lab scientists, and today's lucky few are Deco Puma, Fred Hamilton, and the one they call Kyle. Our super special supporters supreme, aka collaborators, are Turner Zay, the benevolent misanthrope, Schleppy the Schwagster, Microwave, the suits ruined our fun, What the Chuck, Bitrot, E the iPi, SXP, ZomboDB, and Dysfunctional Potato. I hid their names somewhere in this video, and I made them permanent parts of the workshop.
Can you find them? Maybe if you type it into the search bar, you can. Oh, shit, I just spoiled it. She went to the bathroom. I'm just talking to no one. If our lab assistants were knights of the round table, we wouldn't just need a larger table. We would need a larger castle to fit that table, because there are so many of them. Hail to, but seriously, ladies, gentlemen, cyborgs, every name I just read out loud is fake. Seriously, on with the real subscribers. Got you now, you f***. <laughs> Michael Creamer Jr., Robert Breeze, a Zunda wielder of iron heater of shrink. Sticks like the river, not the band. Micah, note to self, add joke here, Friedman. Nuclear 314, Granville Schmidt, good suck. VPS data, Dr. Mrs. The Merman, cock to Birdman Bill. Cameron McPherson, talent Democrat socialist, and pretty righteous dude, Dash Zach. Haley Kerman, Vi Watch, Martin Titonium, Incognito, powerful CCH, circle Zero Michael Stormby Design. I inspire the next layer's YouTube channel, so you guys should check that out. The Monk, Boulder Creek Yard, James. Ergay. Shh, don't tell my wife. Visit Oma3dprints.com for all your 3D printed RPG product needs. SKL, Jason, Eddie, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Jamie, Sunburnt Cat, Spia, Olive Roberts, Olive Robbins, Lydia K, Maxlock is a backstabbing barbarian, Sox McGox, Shane Frederick, DVD, Protagonist, Moonkin, Steve's Dad, Bill Schooler, Big Bird Tommy, What Goes Bump in the Night, Xanforian, Agent Maxwell, Nathan Johnson, Bum Tickly 69, Nova Ren, Amanishi, Danny Devoid of Life, a corn. How many characters can I enter in this field? Anyways, a lot apparently. Like way more than I thought I could. I mean, it's just <laughs> righty, loosey, lefty, tidy. Dennis Kempen. Measure once, t cut twice, re-glue, cut again. John loves Jen. Adam Birch. Z Varka, Iron Rain, Password123, how do they know? Renaud Bataille, General Buck Turgidson, Cross Threading is just free Loctite, double the threads, double the strength. Aaron Steers, Cody, Bryn, six foot five figure, Forlorn Wolf Shelty, Steven, six foot six figure, six pack Shelty, Bradley Carter, Man on Broken Horse, Dax Dashwardly seeks Seth's checks, Quantumly Tangled, even Bluetooth has a right to repair, Doom Crew Inc., VK2KTJ, Mike. Matthew Arrington, Kevin DeGraff, King Willem of Orange the Banished, down with Nat the Usurper, Karunamon, not a Digimon, 6A6F656E75, Bob Dobbington, Cameron Ogletree, the Antifa, Blamo, Jiggle the Puffs, Rinry, Bootsy Von Poopstein, probably not three raccoons in a trench coat, Noah B. Johnson, Kermit the OG Frog, Paul Gibbs, Onyx Plague, Michael Roche, Cacophony of Failure, Rusty Flute, my dog is a bear, Brad Cox, Call Sign Carrot, Burn It, Advanced AI Building Real Christopher since 2023, look me up if you want one. Formerly known as Juicy Legend, Drinker of J The Cuttlefish, Pussy Nugget, King Shaming Walrus, Craft Computing, Creamy McCreams, Creamiest Creme Crematory, Cliff Henning, Scroto Sagans, Quality Doggo, Period Cloth, <laughs> Trans Rights, Elite Giant, Topher, Thunder Chicken, The Lizards Are Watching, Zach, Zap 603, Trump Did Nothing Wrong, My Husband Watches, Now So Now I Am Too, So Hi to Me and Urge. Yeah. Colin J. Webb writes, private health insurers are middle leeches providing no value and are underqualified to deny treatment. I think you may have me confused with bread tube. Travis Hippa, Bird Duck 3, Vigeli, Mike Kelly, Emily, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, and in a world where Zach's with a K and Zach's with an H wage war never ending, one man blazes a new path. They call him Z.A.C. Harvey. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the future. Cut. Oh sh! he's not in the room. Brooke! Come back, I need you to cut!